So we wanted to talk about attack detection for Markov chains. So let me remind you. So we have like x1, xt, xt plus 1. This is Markov chain. It takes values in the set capital X. For now, let's assume that capital X is a discrete set. No, n is already used. Uh, n is used, so what should I use? Uh, I don't know. Let me just use cardinality of x. So uh, x is a set of, the, it's the state space. And the state space has a finite number of elements. And at every point of time, you look at, you observe xt. And then at the next time step, you see xt plus 1. And then the probability, there is a conditional probability. And this is called as transition kernel or probability. Some people call it transition kernel. Some people call it transition probability. I know that we are also using kernel for something else. So we'll just stick to, we'll just stick to transition probability in this class because uh, we are using kernel method. So there is a kernel there as well. Uh, kernel has a lot of meaning in mathematics. So, so that's why uh, for the purpose of this class, we'll use transition probability. <clears throat> so typically this P, in the case of finite state Markov chain, it will be in the form of a matrix where XT will be the rows and xt plus 1 will correspond to columns. So this is 0, 1, trace 2. x cross x. That's the size of this particular matrix. This is the transition probability matrix. And the rows will sum to 1. That's the, prop that's the property of this transition probability matrix. OK, so we had talked about it in the previous class. Uh, we've talked about also situations where the that there are processes that are not Markov in nature, especially processes where there is a delay uh, in the passage of information, or there is a delay in the dynamics. So we talked about an example, which is not a Markov process. So, so this is uh, so what we are. So let's look at the example of this particular room. So the temperature of this room. Let's assume that the temperature of the room is in the set 69, 70, 71, 72, 73. 69, 70, 71, 72, 73. Anytime we observe that the temperature is not in the set, we'll just uh, do a quantization. And if it is 70.25, then we'll just say that the temperature is 70. On the other hand, if it is 70.75, we will say that the temperature is 71, OK? So this is the set of temperature we have in this room. So the cardinality of the set is 5. We have five states, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And let's say t to t plus 1 is uh, 1 minute. So at every point of time, uh, at every minute, so 3.01, 3.02 p.m., 3.03 p.m., I'm going to observe what the temperature is and put it in one of these five numbers, five buckets. 
So then what is the temperature reading? So I'll have the temperature x 3 p.m. That will be, um, I don't know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit x 3.01 p.m. That will be 71 degrees Fahrenheit x 3.02 p.m. That will be 69 degrees Fahrenheit and so on. So at every point of time, we are measuring the temperature and I'm getting a time series. That's this time series I was referring to. Okay, so I look at the entire history. So I have the historical record of this room going back to 1960s, let's say. I have the temperature reading. Uh, how am I going to figure out what the transition probability is? How will I know what the transition probability is? Well, the way to find out the transition probability would be to look at all the transition from xt to xt plus 1, and then divide it by the total number of transition from xt to all x prime. Well, total number of xt actually. That's all in the data set. So basically, uh, if I say P of xt plus 1 equals to 72, given xt equals to 70, I'm going to look at the entire history of this particular room. Whenever the temperature was 70 and at the next minute the temperature became 72, I'm going to record it as 1, otherwise I'll record it as 0. And then I'll count how many 1s are there and how many times I have seen the temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the room and that will give me the transition kernel. So that's this kernel. So this is the same as probability of xt equals to 70, xt plus 1 equals to 72, divided by the probability that xt equals to 70. This is how you find out the transition kernel. All of these three are basically the same value. Any questions so far? <coughs> So I look at the number of times this joint uh, distribution happens, and then the number of times uh, xt is equal to 70, the ratio of it gives me the transition probability. Any questions so far? So uh, now I have a question for you guys. Do you think I can have, what should the probability of xt equals to 69, xt plus 1 equals to 73 going to be? Well, let me do, write it in the conditional form. So xt plus 1 equals to 73 given xt equals to 69. What do you think this probability, this conditional probability is going to look like? What is the probability that the temperature at a specific time is 69, but at the next minute the temperature becomes 73? What do you think? You have been in this room for, I don't know, 30 hours now. <laughs> this is lecture number 25, so you've been in this room for 25 hours. Have we ever faced a situation where we went from a low temperature to a high temperature in a matter of one minute? No, we have never been in this situation. So most likely this probability is going to be zero. Okay, this is just to illustrate. Have we ever been in a situation where 
xt plus 1 equals to 69, but xt is equal to 73. That is also zero. We've never faced a situation in the last 25 hours that we've spent in this room when the temperature jumped from 73, or not jumped, but dropped from 73 to 69 in a matter of one minute. <clears throat> right, all of us agree with this, these two statements. Now let's try to change the statement a little bit. So instead of looking at successive temperature, let me look at temperature 60 minutes down the line. So it's no longer T plus one, now I'm looking at T plus 60. Do you think in the last 60 years of the history of this room, this could have happened? It jumped from 69 to 73 in a matter of 60 minutes. It could have happened, right? It's rare, maybe it would have happened only 1% of the time. It could be rare, but it can still potentially happen, okay? So that's how you, that just to give you an idea of what the transition probability is going to look like. And so, this is P of xt plus 1 equals to 1 given xt. This is P of xt plus 1 equals to 2 given xt and so on. So if you look at every row, it gives you for different values of, for the same value of xt. So xt corresponds to the row, right? So you look at a row. So for that particular xt, what's the probability that xt plus one takes the first value, the second value, the third value, the fourth value, and so on. As a result of which, if you add up the row, it sums to one. Okay. I can say the same thing about velocity of the vehicle. I can say the same thing about the rotational speed of the tire sensors. I can say the same thing about uh, the temperature of this entire building. Uh, the position of the rocket, the velocity of the rocket, the velocity of the autonomous vehicle. So no matter which autonomous system you pick, you can record the states and you can come up with this transition kernel based on the physical model of that particular system. If you don't have the physical model of the system, you can still estimate it using this particular uh, counting, uh, by, by counting the number of transitions divided by the number of times xt has happened. That gives you the transition kernel. Any questions so far? I'm going to erase everything from the board now. Okay, no question. What do you think is going to happen in a cyber attack? So I have the temperature reading of this room and there is an attacker who wants to attack the temperature sensor of this particular building. So I am an attacker. I want to spoof the temperature reading of this building, okay, of this, of this room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand in front of the temperature sensor and I'm going to put my thumb on the temperature sensor. Okay, so now it's no longer reading the temperature of the room. It's reading the temperature of my thumb, which is the body temperature. So that could be an attack on the system or I could just hack into the system and I can start sending random data at every point of time. So I, I know that there is will be a measurement at 3.01 p.m. I'm going to send the wrong information at that particular point of time. So we saw that kind of thing happening in that 
in that car example, the car video that we had seen. So the braking command, the sensing command, all of those commands were changed at random points of time. So here, the null hypothesis in the case of a dynamic system is x1 to xt, uh, this is generated from the transition kernel pxt plus 1, sorry, transition probability pxt plus 1 given xt. The alternate hypothesis q xt plus 1 given xt. This is q. And I know both p and q. So the null hypothesis is there is no attack on the system. So whatever temperature reading I'm seeing is basically generated from the true system. The true system's transition probability is p. On the other hand, when there is an attacker present in the system, then this whole sequence of readings that I'm observing is actually generated from transition probability q. Now the question is, how do we differentiate between p and q? How do we know that uh, if we know both p and q, how do we know that the data is actually getting generated from p and not from q? So here is the test statistic. Uh, let me write it, write its name. So this is log likelihood. So this is the different log likelihood than the one you studied in the previous lecture. So uh, that log likelihood was just for a probability distribution, but now here we have a transition probability. But the idea is basically the same. So here is how you would construct the log likelihood function. Sk to n equals to summation t equals k to n. Oh, I need to define something. Let me define omega naught x, x prime such that uh, p of x prime given x is greater than zero. So the probability that the current temperature is x and the next minute temperature is x prime, that probability has to be zero. I'm gonna look at all the pairs that is feasible. So in our previous example, 69.73 was not in omega naught and 73.69 was not in omega naught. So there was no, not a single time in the history of this room, the temperature has gone from 69 degrees Fahrenheit to 73 degrees Fahrenheit in one minute and never in the history of this room temperature has gone from 73 degrees Fahrenheit to 69 degrees Fahrenheit within a minute. So that's what the set omega naught is uh, trying to portray. And so here I will have xt, xt plus one in omega naught natural log of q xt plus 1 given xt over p xt plus 1 given xt.
So I've observed x, x1, x2 all the way up to xt, or maybe I should put xn here. So I've observed all the way from x1 to xn. I'm looking at the tail of the sequence, so I'm going to look at xk to xn, okay, just the tail of the sequence. This summation is basically there just to make sure that we are not looking at situation where you have log of 0 over 0. Okay, that's all the need for this particular summation is. So you can kind of ignore this summation because we are looking at only points where this is non-zero and this is non-zero. Remember, right? So P of X prime given X has to be greater than zero. So we're just avoiding zero over zero kind of situation in this particular, in this summation. So ignore this summation. Uh, we will look at the, so remember that transition probability is actually a matrix. So we'll look at the entry of the matrix xt, xt plus one for the matrix Q, this matrix Q. And then I'm going to look at the same entry for P. I'm going to divide it and then I'm going to take a log and then I'm going to sum it up over the tail of all the readings. And then my test statistic is max one is less than equal to k is less than equal to n, s k to n, and my rejection region is tau infinity. This is also called a Q sum. This is Q-sum statistic. We have seen many examples of Q-sum statistic, so this is just one of those many algorithms that are constructed using Q-sum statistic. Any question so far? Any cool observation that you can make from this particular statistic? Here is a pretty cool thought process. So remember we are only looking at X and X prime that are in omega naught. So what happens if you are looking at the reading and you see 73 and 69. Successive temperatures is 73 and 69. What would you do? You can immediately raise the alarm because what will happen is this particular thing is going to blow up. It will become infinity because one of the term is zero, the other term is non-zero. So I'm observing xt to xt plus one, but actually xt to xt plus one can never happen. It's not part of omega naught. So this term will become infinity. And so log of infinity is infinity. So SK of N, SK to N becomes infinity. And this uh, test statistic will become infinity because there is a max here. So within a second, if an adversary gives you consecutive readings that cannot happen in under the normal circumstances, then the test statistic is going to blow up. And within a second, Within one minute, you will be able to figure out if there is an adversary in the room or not. Okay, so that's the very, that's the cool thing here that if you know what the successive, the transition probability matrix looks like and you see successive iterate which are supposed to be probability zero, but you're seeing some data with positive probability, it means that there is an attack on the system. So that's the benefit of this uh, log likelihood function, uh, log likelihood based uh, attack detection. If it's a stealthy attacker, so what is called, who is a stealthy attacker? So a stealthy attacker, let me define what a stealthy attacker is going to do. So, so okay, actually this is a question for you. Uh, 
So you know that this is the algorithm that university has applied on all the rooms and you want to attack the temperature sensor of the room. How are you going to generate the temperature readings? Okay, so you will do it very slowly. So her idea is that she doesn't want to get detected. She wants to be stealthy and she still wants to attack the university. That's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> uh, but if you want to attack, you can do it very slowly. You can move the temperature very slowly. What will happen is uh, it's going to take a very, very long time for this SKN to become large enough for you to start detecting. Because remember, tau is a threshold. You want this thing to go be above the threshold. So it's going to take a long time. If you change this Q very slowly, it's going to take a long time for people to detect that something wrong is happening inside the system. So that's one way to do it. What's another way to do it? What's another way to spoof? I'm sure you guys have watched that Ocean's 11, Ocean's 12, 13, all those movies, you know, the the movies where the thieves, what do they do before they actually steal the items? Like yeah, but how do they generate the fake data? They are generating the fake data and they are streaming it to the security guards in the casino. But how are they generating that data? How are they generating the video feed? They get previous, previous recording. Okay. So, I can record the temperature reading from the last one year and I can just replay the same recording and you will never be able to detect under this particular detection scheme. You won't be able to detect it. So that's the, that's how you can be stealthy. So just replay, that's called a replay attack. You basically record the data and just replay the same data again and again and uh, you will be undetected. Log likelihood will not be able to detect your presence, your attack in the system. Okay. So that's the drawback of log likelihood. Uh, it's a very good algorithm if uh, the attacker cannot replay, but if the attacker has the option of replaying, then it's a very bad detection scheme, okay? Now here the other assumption is we know P and Q. It's okay to know P because I have the last 60 years of data of the temperature reading of this particular room, so I know what P is. But I really don't know how the adversary is going to attack, how the adversary is going to change the temperature reading of this room. Okay, so, so actually making this assumption that I know Q is actually bad. Maybe I don't know Q. Maybe I don't know how the, temp how the attacker is going to uh, change the temperature of this room. So how am I going to do things now? So I don't know Q. What will you do? Any ideas? So remember my Q is, Q is a five cross five matrix in this case. Not R. So Q is five cross five matrix. So you are responsible uh, for figuring out if there is an attacker in the system or not, and you don't know what the attacker is going to do. 
how will you come up with an attack? What would you do? In the previous case, the assumption was I know both P and Q. Now the assumption is I know P. There is no way in hell I'm going to know what Q is going to be. I cannot predict what the attacker is going to do. What you can do in that situation is you will look at the last 10, 15, 20 minutes of data and then you are going to come up with Q hat, which is the estimate of Q. Now remember that this, in this case, the Q hat, the Q matrix is supposed to have 25 entries. You get one entry every minute. You get one reading every minute. So how many minutes of data do you need in order to fill this matrix Q hat? How many minutes of data do you think you will have to observe in order to get a good estimate of Q hat? There are 25 entries in that matrix. 25 minutes, kind of, sort of. What if the 25 minutes, the temperature is going to be just, I don't know, 70, 71, 72. In that case, you will only be able to observe this part of the matrix corresponding to the rows of 70, 71, 72 and the columns of 70, 71, 72. What happens to the columns of 69 and columns of 73? Or 70, yeah, 73. Those two columns you won't be able to see, observe. So you have to do probably more than 25 minutes. You may have to do it for five hours, six hours. So you have to look at the last six hours of your temperature reading, fill up this matrix Q hat. If you could not figure out some of the readings were not there, you can just set it equal to zero. I mean, you can do it even at the end of 60 minutes, but then a lot of entries will become zero because you have not observed them at all in your last 60 minutes of data set. How will you change this particular QSUM scheme? So I'm going to uh, do it with Q hat, but this Q hat is uh, deduced from so remember, I'm looking at the time t equals to k to n. So this q hat will also be estimated from the uh, from the time step k to n. So looking at the reading uh, from k to n. So this is one change that I made. There is no color chalk. So I'm making a change here. The other change I'm going to make is I'm going to add n minus m here, where m is number of time steps needed to estimate q hat. That's this number. Everything else remains the same. So no difference, except that now I'm going to use the readings in order to construct my matrix Q hat. And then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use that Q hat in order to compute this log likelihood function. What is the drawback of this algorithm? The benefit is I don't need to know Q. I don't need to know Q. The drawback is I need to spend 60 minutes, six hours, five hours before I can actually start doing the attack detection. I need six hours. I have to look at the entire six hours of data before I can actually detect an attack. So that's the drawback. So this M is basically six hours. So six hours, how many minutes do we have in six hours? 360. So you can pick M equals to 25, you can pick M equals to 60, you can pick M equals to 360, but at least you need like those many hours or those many minutes 
uh, you can't really detect an attack because you are collecting data in order to estimate the matrix Q. The other issue is of computational complexity. So you have to estimate it for data that you have observed between Q, to Q and N, K for, sorry, data you have observed between K and N. So you have to compute this matrix. Every time you get some more data, you have to recompute this matrix, you have to recompute this sum, you have to recompute this max, and then you can detect the attack reliably. So that's another issue with this particular algorithm, which is you'll have to do a lot of recomputation every time new data arrives. So it cannot be used in a real time setting. Alternatively, if you want to use it in a real time setting, you want to make sure that the, the number of states is very, very low. So instead of having five states, you can have only two states, like on and off. You have only two states, then you have only four entries in the matrix, because it will be two cross two matrix. And then you can probably uh, speed up the computation considerably by having fewer number of states. What will you do if you don't have uh, two states? What if you don't have on off? What if you have like a temperature reading of this room? How can you simplify the computation for this algorithm? You can do quantization. So you can say low and high. So temperature is low if it is below 72. Temperature is high if it is above 72. And then you can, now you have two states, low and high. And then you can, this matrix is only two cross two matrix. So that is known as quantization, right? So you're quantizing the observation in order to uh, run this particular algorithm. Any question? Yes. So, is this can solve the problem you just proposed if we replay the? Yes. Yeah, this is this is not robust to replay attack. Also, like this is also bad for replay attack. It will not work. Yeah, because Q hat, in the case of replay, again Q hat will be very close to P, and you know you won't be able to detect detect the attack. Okay, perfect. Uh, we will talk about dynamic watermarking algorithm in a few days from now, maybe on Wednesday, maybe next week. So then we will figure out how to detect those replay attacks and, and so on. So dynamic watermarking algorithm allows us to be robust to replay attacks. Oh, uh, let me keep it like this. Okay, uh, so we now know what to do when we know P and we don't know Q. What's the natural next problem to solve? The next problem to solve is we don't know P and we don't know Q. We don't know what the current model is and we don't know what the future model is going to look like under attack. So in the previous lecture, we talked about kernel methods. In the kernel methods, we didn't need to know what the pre-attack probability distribution was. We didn't, know, we didn't need to know what the post-attack probability distribution was. Right? So we are going to extend the kernel method for this particular problem. I'm going to write down the assumption that we need to make for this case. So the assumption is I want the transition probability of xt plus 1 
in a set, I need to give the set a name. X is already used, X bar, given xm given x0 is greater than or equal to lambda phi of x bar. So lambda is greater than 0 and phi is a probability distribution. So there exists m lambda greater than 0 and a measure phi such that this condition holds. This is also, this assumption is also required for the previous uh, algorithm to work. So we are going to make the same assumption. So I'll explain what this assumption is trying to do. So this is my uh, this is my state space. This is my x. Okay. I know that we have used discrete points, but I'm just going to do use it use a box in order to show those uh, discrete points because I don't want to. Uh, it's much easier to visualize it in the box. So what I'm saying is there is a set. Let me call this set x hat. Let me call this set x hat. And no matter from where I start within the set, if I look at the trajectory, if I run this particular point for m time steps, I'm going to hit the set x hat at some point of time. So this is m time steps. So, so I run it for m time steps. Sometimes I don't hit the set. But sometimes I hit the set. I'm going to enter the x hat at some point of time. Like not at some point of time. Exactly after m time steps, uh, sometimes I might be outside of the set x, x hat but sometimes I will go inside the set x hat in exactly m time steps. That's what this assumption is trying to do. And this has to happen from all the points. So these are the ways. So these are all the m trajectories that I have drawn. Sorry, uh, these are all the trajectories that I have drawn starting from this particular point. But as you can see, no matter from where you start, you always have a trajectory that, it's a, that goes inside x hat in exactly m time steps. Okay? What this means for this temperature of the room example, so no matter what temperature it is right now, I know that in 30 minutes, there is a very high probability that the temperature will be 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Because, because the thermostat is set at 72, so it may be 73 right now, it may be 69, it may be 72. But I know that in exactly 30 minutes from now, so m equals to 30, in exactly 30 minutes from now, I know that there is a very high chance that the temperature will be 72 degrees Fahrenheit. This assumption is known as Doblin condition. This 
This is known as Doblin condition. It's a very common assumption to make on the Markov chain. This assumption is very, very well satisfied in queuing systems. So I know you've done one example of queues, but in queuing systems, Doblin condition is generally kind of sort of satisfied as long as the queue is stable. And basically the idea there is, if you look at Panera Bread or if you look at Starbucks, I know you might have gone there several times. There is a possibility that you will go to Starbucks and you will find that there is nobody at the counter. Okay, so that's the set X hat that is always reached in a certain time step at Starbucks or at Panera Bread or any of these places. What happens if uh, they don't have enough servers at the Starbucks or Panera, they don't have enough counters to place the order. In that case, the queue is going to increase and you will see a long line outside Starbucks, right? Or long line outside Panera Bread. So those are the situation where Doblin condition is not satisfied, okay? Because the queue is growing. Otherwise, if it was stable, if it, were, if it had enough number of people to serve the customers, then you will always have an X hat, which is like zero customers on the, on the terminal. So there'll be always a situation where there are zero customers at the terminal. And no matter from where you start, no matter how large number of people come in, in 30 minutes, the queue will get flushed. There'll be nobody standing at the counter for placing an order because that's how the system was designed. So I know you probably don't think about it, but if you happen to open a store, I think this is something you will really have to think about. How many people to put at the front desk so that uh, you don't have a long queue going out of your business? Okay. So Doblin condition allows us to prove results. So the algorithm that we talked about, uh, the, the previous one where we were estimating Q, that also requires Doblin condition. In order to prove that you will be able to detect, if Doblin condition is not satisfied, you will still be able to run the algorithm. There is no guarantee whether you will actually be able to detect something or not. It's just that when there is Doblin condition is satisfied, you will be able to provably detect, even though you might detect after a very long time. Okay. So now we are looking at a situation where I don't know P, I don't know Q, I have a reference data set from yesterday, which is X naught all the way to XR. From yesterday, and then I have the current data. y0 to yn. This is the last n data point. Maybe I'll use r minus 1 because I want n data points and r data points. So I have yesterday's data, which is a reference data set. I have the current data, which is uh, the last end data point, so I'm looking at the last 20, 30 minutes, 50 minutes, 100 minutes of this room. What I'm going to do is create second order Markov chains. How do I create second order Markov chain? I'm going to define x tilde zero as x zero, x one, x tilde one as x one, x two, x tilde two as x two, x three, and so on. Same thing, y tilde zero equals to y zero, y one, y tilde n, minus one, O. Okay, sorry. I need to take XR and YN. YN minus one, YN. So I've removed the minus one here. I had minus one, minus one here. I've removed both of them. 
So now I have R plus one data points from yesterday and I have N plus one data points from the last 15, 20, 30 minutes of data. And I'm constructing a second order Markov chain where I'm looking at successive points, successive observations, and I'm creating a tuple, a new variable, x tilde zero, x tilde one, x tilde two, and so on. And then you apply the kernel method So we have talked about the kernel method in the previous class, right? So you have all the expressions that are needed. So you apply the kernel method on this successive data point, okay? And then uh, you can detect whether an attack is happening or not. So that will solve this particular problem. You can actually detect. So this is the reference data. This is the data generated from the reference data. And then you are, what you are checking is uh, whether the current data is from the same distribution as reference data or current data is from a different distribution than the reference data. So this algorithm is something that my PhD student designed a couple of years back. Uh, he's still in his final year, but uh, this is actually his work. Uh, he's designed some more algorithms like beyond this particular algorithm, but, uh, but this is something that he wrote a paper about uh, two, three years back. So at this point of time, like, you know, before we wrote the paper, it was very unclear how do we solve this problem with unknown P and unknown Q. It's quite obvious how do you solve with known P and unknown Q, but unknown P, unknown Q was unsolved. And so that's what uh, we worked on. So any question before we uh, disperse from today's class? No? Yeah. Two times, yeah. Uh, you can have third order Markov chain, fourth order Markov chain, and so on. And what we had proved was that second order Markov chain also satisfies Doblin condition. So that was the critical challenge. Uh, so if the first order Markov chain satisfies Doblin, second order would also satisfy Doblin. And therefore, you can apply kernel methods to come up with the attack detection algorithm. Okay, so if there are no further questions, uh, we'll meet on Wednesday. Thank you.